get recorded. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special evening. Folks, this is what we call Pesach Bootcamp. Hey, Ed. Welcome. Welcome to Pesach Bootcamp where you don't need spandex. And you don't need, I mean, you could also, but you don't need spandex, nor do you need, what else don't you need? You don't need um, a yoga mat. You don't need weights. No, this boot camp, you know, next door, right? Next, have you ever seen what they do next door? Have you guys seen what they do next door in this uh, workout place? They lift, Ed, you know what I'm talking about. Next door. Oh, oh my gosh. Are you kidding me? Next door, they take like these heavy iron metal something and they, they push it up a hill. Yeah. And I'm oh. thinking literally, literally these people are building pyramids. It's like, oh my gosh, we, we broke out of this condition. We, we earned our freedom. And now we're back to like schlepping heavy things up an incline. Anyway, but it's a good thing. It gets you healthy. It's definitely good. Healthy is good. You know what they say? Allah in, not Allah in cup. Uh, by the, I'll, I'll say the English. A small hole in the body leads to a large hole in the soul. In other words, we've got to take care of our body. That helps take care of our spirituality as well. All right, but that's not the subject of today's class. Today, it's all about the Pesach boot camp slash Torah studies hybrid. Our focus is, of course, the upcoming holiday of Passover. Pesach begins next weekend. Next weekend, Friday night is the Seder. Friday night Seder, it's always cool when it works out like that. It's kind of over the weekend. So the two day, two opening days of the holiday are Friday night, uh, uh, sorry, are, are, are sh Friday night Saturday and Saturday night Sunday. So it's weekend stuff. We can be all in on this. Hey, Matt, welcome. You too can grab a cookie while we discuss the Haggadah, which again, just feels totally wrong and yet right. So we're going to explore tonight. We're going to explore the Seder or specifically a piece of the Haggadah that I think is fascinating. And I would venture to say most of us have overlooked all these years. I know it's a hot take, but I'm telling you, I think that we tend to overlook this piece of the Haggadah. And it is one of the most important messages that we could ever hear sitting at a Seder. So my goal tonight is to explain <laughs> a piece of the Seder that we all say. And delve deep. We're going to ask a bunch of questions and hopefully come away with a lot of insight. So that's objective number one. That's hopefully going to um, inspire your, your, your preparations for Pesach so that your Pesach, your Passover is experienced on a, on, a, on a deeper level. And the last piece of the objective, you ready? The last piece of the objective is that you should have something to share at your Seder. Everyone's looking for good material. Everyone wants you at your Seder. It's like, I got this great insight. I want to share it inspire everybody this is right that's like it's one of the one of the objectives of preparing for the seder is to get some good good uh material so my goal is to give you some good material to share but first i ask you the question i'm turning the tables on all y'all the question is for northerner i'm, I'm struggling for the all y'alls but hopefully they came out okay my question is what is your favorite part of the haggadah favorite part of the seder now, by the way, I'm using these words interchangeably, although they're different. Seder means the whole evening. The Haggadah is the booklet, is the, the text, right? What's your favorite part? We'll just stick with the Seder. What's your favorite part of the Seder? Favorite part? The festive meal. Good. Sorry, Paul? The festive meal. Festive meal. Yeah. Shulchan Aruch. Yeah. Shulchan Aruch. That's, that's a good part. What else? Favorite part? Favorite? Four questions. Good. I'll ask you why. Joking, joking. That was all right. Um, next year in Jerusalem. Next year in Jerusalem. Excellent. Good. What else? Highlights, highlights, Seder highlights. It's waiting for someone to say that. Thank you, Ed, for coming up big on that. Right. How's the babka? No, I'm kidding. Right. So I'm, I'm like too obsessed with the confluence of, of Hametz and Matzah together. Anyway, finding the Afikoman or hiding the Afikoman. The kids hide the Afikoman and then the, well, Different, everyone has different customs. Some in some places the parents hide the Afrikom and the kids have to find it. Some places the kids hide and the parents have to find it. And until the parents find it, the kids can start um, negotiating. That's how we used to do it, right? So the kids hide it, and then the parents are looking for it, and then they're like, "We gotta have the Afrikom to finish the seder." And then you're like, "Okay, well, how much is that worth to you? Is it worth to you a new scooter, bike, baseball glove, football, bass? Like, what's?" Uh, 
What would you what would you give to have your Rafi Komen if that were a conversation we would have on this night of freedom? Right. Anyway, it's a night of extortion, a night of freedom. And there are some commenters that actually some rabbis who said they don't like the custom of the kids swiping the African because it teaches, you know, theft and, and, and extortion and that sort of thing, blackmail. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Customs are customs. They differ. And uh, and that's it. Any other any other highlights uh, opening up? I think everyone here said something. You said everyone said something, right? Any um, online online crew jump in with any highlights of your Seder? Give me highlights. Adrian, welcome. Joking. It's good. Hey, joking yeah. about the matzah. I'm sorry, the gefilte fish. Gefilte fish. Okay, good. But good. jokes. Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like Gonna it. Take long to catch. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I like um, gefilte fish if there's very hot horseradish. I don't like mild horseradish. By the way, you like um, uh, uh, strong horseradish. I mean, the Seder is your night. At least Chabad, our custom is like for the marar, for the for the horse, for the um, the bitter herbs. What we do is we use a little bit of romaine lettuce and then some shredded, some raw shredded horseradish. That'll that'll clear sinuses and your friend's sinuses. Don't ask me how. It, that like clears adjacent sinuses. That's really, uh, it just gets you going. We'll have it here at the Chabad Seder. By the way, the way to do that, super simple. You just peel, you just peel a horseradish, you run it through. I mean, back in the day, you would be like, you know, using a, a what's it called again? A um, grater. There you grater. go. Grater. Uh, but today, food processor, put it through on the grating blade, bada bing, bada boom, you got it. I think I mentioned this in another class recently. Just don't open up that top when you're doing it. Like after you've grated in the machine, you open it up. If you're there, like all in, and that'll 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 just e evoke all the emotions uh, without feeling anything. But that'll just like open up the tear ducts. All right. So we have a lot of highlights of the of the seder. The seder is comprised of fourteen steps. There are fourteen steps of the seder: kadesh, orchatz, karpas, yachatz, magid, rachza, motzi matza, maror, korech, shochan orech. Safon, Beirach, Halal, Nirza. Wow, that's a lot of steps. Those are 14 in case you were counting. And they and I'll just go through the first few. So we st we begin with what we call on the night of the Seder, we call Kadesh, which is really Kiddush. We start off by sanctifying the day with a glass of wine. There are four cups of wine total. Number one, yeah, it's, it's a long night. So number one begins with a Kiddush, Kadesh. Then Orchats, then we wash the hands. Now, on a typical night, Friday night, you would do Kiddush, wash the hands, and go to the bread. Well, not at the Seder. Because after the Orchats, after we wash the hands, the next step is, yeah, uh, sorry, Kaddish, Orchats, Karpas. The next step is we take a, a, a vegetable and dip it in salt water, which is done for the express reason to incite the child's curiosity. The child says, what in the world is happening? We did Kiddush. Right, we did. We we sank. We said the blessing over the wine and drank the wine. We washed the hands. Now we're dipping a vegetable. Why is this night different than all their nights? Boom! You got the kid. Boom! Experiential questioning. You create a scenario that is now just messing with, not in a good way, but just changing things around. The child is asking. Judaism is all about experiential learning, right? We're not learning it from a from a from a PowerPoint. We're learning it from experience. We're engaging the child through experience, through experiential. Uh, situations that evoke questions so that the conversation can flow organically after we've set it up in such a way to, to flow organically. So then you, you dip the vegetable in salt water and then you have the yachats, karpas yachats, you break the middle matzah and then you begin with the magid. Step number four is magid. And in magid, you tell the story of the exodus. You tell the story of slavery. You tell the story of freedom. You tell the story. How does Magid begin? Again, it's not the beginning beginning of your Maxwell House or whatever it is, beginning of your Haggadah. It starts with maybe candle lighting or whatever, or Kaddish. But the first few steps, Kiddish and washing and vegetable dipping and breaking the middle matzah, Kaddish, Orchatz, Kaddish, Yachatz, Magid. Sorry, Magid is the fifth step. After that, you settle in for the story. The bulk of the most pages of your Haggadah are the Magid. 
right? That's when everyone falls asleep. I'm kidding. But that's when, like, that's the, that's where you settle in for the story. Upon which, when you finish that, that's when you eat the matzah and the mara, and you mix the two together for the sandwich, and then you have the meal. But that part of, like, that evokes the question, when do we eat? That's called the maggot. The maggot is when we tell the story, which is really the main, one of the main features of the Seder night, is telling the story. How does it begin? How does the maggot begin? Hey, lach ma'anya, we say. Or some people say, halach ma'anya. Hey, lach ma'anya, diachala vasana ba'ara de Mitzrayim. We say this is the bread of affliction. This is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. And when we do so, here, grab this. When we do so, we actually uncover the matzot partially. We uncover the matzot a little bit so we can see it. And we say, this is the bread of affliction. So I want to read to you the Helach Manya. Now, I thought it was in the Siddur. I thought we would have a handy reference, but we don't. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to use the text here. The text in front of us splits it up into three different readings, which I'm not crazy about. Um, I wish they would have just put it into one reading and then we would divide it on our own. But we're going to go with the flow. We're going to go with what we got. And I'm going to read these together. It's going to be text one, three, and four. We're going to skip text two. Text one, three, and four are the three are, are the first, second, and third parts of this opening. This opening um, uh, a paragraph of the maggot. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to read this, and then I want to turn it over to you for questions. Which means I want you, as I read this, I want you to think about questions that you have on this opening paragraph. And just to be clear here, this is the first thing that you say after you do the kiddush and the washing and the dipping and the breaking. When you settle into the storytelling, this is how it begins with text number one. I'm going to share for our online crew. I'm going to share this, share my screen so that you can follow along and check out this text. Again, I'm going to read this text one, three, and four. Those are the, the full pieces of this first paragraph. Hey, lach ma'anya, this is the bread of affliction that our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Text number three, whoever is hungry, we declare, come and eat. Whoever is in need, come and participate in the Paschal Lamb. And we conclude the paragraph, text four, this year we are here. Next year we will be in the land of Israel. This year we are enslaved. Next year we will be free. That is the entirety of the opening paragraph, the Helach Manya. That's it. It's divided here into three parts. It's driving me crazy as you know, but that's the one paragraph that opens the market. And my question to you is simple. What are your questions on this text? What are your questions? And every question is valid. Remember, remember, we begin by calling it the bread of affliction. Then we talk about whoever's hungry, come and eat. Then we talk about this year, we're here. This year, we're slaves. Next year, land of Israel. Next year, we're free. All right, jump in. Jump in. Questions? Questions? <laughs> good. It's good to cheat. Yes. Matt's asking a great question. Question number one that we have on the table is, we declare opening opening um, statement, the opening statement of the, of, the, of the maggot, of Passover night. We're gathered around the table, family and friends, and we say, this is, and we're, we're looking at the, at the matzah, this is the bread of affliction. So Matt's question is, why bread of affliction? That we ate in Egypt? Didn't they eat this bread when they left Egypt? In other words, what should we call it? The bread of freedom. Freedom, freedom bread. It sounds like post 9 11, right? Freedom bread. Remember, uh, I don't know why I look at you. French fries, right? <laughs> freedom fries. Yeah, we were all in on that for, I don't know, a week, a month, right? What's going on here? Shouldn't we call Why are we calling the bread of affliction, right? Who's bread of affliction? That's like so 3,333 years ago. Bread of affliction? My folks in the negative. Bread of freedom. This is freedom bread, baby, right? I mean, you're paying so much for it, for the handmade stuff. It better be bread of freedom. That's, that's why I purchased it for it. The bread of affliction. Man, affliction because of, of, the, of the wallet cost. Anyway, all jokes. Yeah, you with me on that? Good question. Excellent question. Next, more questions. Line them up. We can ask dozens of questions on this. Oh, I should probably put it back up for our, for our online crew. Sorry, I pulled it off. Um, again, it's in three different texts. So one text one is bread of affliction, and then the other two are these. I'll put up the other two. Okay, questions, comments. Why are we enslaved? Why are we enslaved? We make a declaration. This year we are enslaved. Next year we'll be free. Slaves to who? Slaves to what? 
right? Why are we declaring that? What else? You want to expand that question a little bit? Or you're good? <laughs> I want to expand that question. I'll expand it soon. <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Let's go. Bring them on. Oh, what does it mean next year? We will be free. Yeah, what's going to happen next year? What's the big, what's the big plan for next year? 23? Yeah, what, what's happening? Yeah. What's the, what do we have on the radar that's suddenly going to change it for next, next year? We're going to be free. Like what's, uh, what's coming that what's, what's like, what do we have coming up? Good. What else? Questions. Well, why are we telling people whoever's hungry to come and eat and who's ever in need come and participate in the Paschal Lamb? I mean, why, why is that front and center? Ah. Oh. Excellent, in excellent. This, in this conversation. Yeah, we, we, we start off the Seder by inviting whoever's hungry, come and eat. Why are we starting off by asking, uh, by, by kind of inviting? How, do, how might we expand that question? Well, to, to participate in this, right? We're really telling them to come, come participate in the Seder. Right. And the retelling of the story. It's not just the It's not just, not just eating. eating. It's not just the eating. It's participating in the whole experience. Okay, good, good, good. Excellent. I always had a question, and, and maybe we'll answer this today. Maybe we won't. Is seems a little bit late for an invitation, no? <laughs> like, as we're in the comfort of our home, it's like, hey, whoever's hungry, and everyone's like, yeah, when are we get into the food? But otherwise, who else are you inviting? Unless you open the windows and shout from the rooftops or whatever it is. Like, what's the, what's the plan? All right, next. Good, excellent. What else? Questions? What do we got? I, by the way, I think we so far have questions in all three of those sections. So I think we're, we're, we're getting there. So let's just recap the, the questions that we have so far. So number one, we started off, the opening paragraph is, hey, this is the bread of affliction. Um, sometimes it's translated in some Haggadahs, I believe, as poor man's bread. You ever hear that expression? This is the poor man's bread. But it's the same concept, bread of affliction, poor man's bread, that they ate in Egypt. Okay, again, a few questions on that. Number one, um, as Matt said, hold on. Isn't this the bread that they ate when they left Egypt? What's going on? And I, I want to expand that question a little bit, you know, just take it to the next step and say, okay, it seems like a weird way to start the Seder. If you would have to characterize the Seder, what would you say? The Seder is, it's about experiencing freedom. So why are we beginning? Uh, yeah, let's talk about slavery. Now you could say, well, you're trying to go from one to the other. You're trying to like show the contrast. I get that, sure. But it seems weird that the first, the opening like salvo, is that the right word? But the opening shot that you're saying is bread of affliction. We're all in this affliction bread. Seems weird. It seems like a, a very negative focus. Like this is the bread of slavery that they ate in Egypt. I know if it says affliction, but it's like in Egypt, they were slaves. So it's like, it's like bread of slavery. Why are we eating bread of slavery? By the way, for those that are familiar with the Haggadah, toward the end of Magid, before we actually eat the matzah, actually right before we eat the matzah, we talk about the main three things of the Seder. Pesach, matzah, mara. And we say, matzah, zu, al, uh, matzah, zu, shana, ochla, mashuma, this matzah that we're eating, why do we eat it? Al -shum, because, I'll just say in English, because the dough didn't have a chance to rise when they were leaving and they took it out. That's what we say at the end of, at the, end of the Magid. A tale, of two con a tale of two matzahs, right? Beginning of the Magad, we say, this is the bread of affliction they ate in Egypt. At the end of Magad, we say, this matzah zoo, this matzah, right? Matzah zoo, uh, it doesn't mean like the Atlanta zoo. Uh, matzah zoo means zoo in Hebrew is this, right? But this matzah that we eat is why? Because of the dough that didn't have a chance to rise when they left. So we call it the bread of freedom. So what I'm saying is, when we talk about what matzah is, the bread of affliction, bread of freedom, we actually say both. Beginning of Magad, we call it bread of affliction. At the end, we call it the bread of freedom. The question is, what's going on? Maybe the message is that we've undergone a journey, a transformation at the Seder. Possibly. Maybe not. It's still, see, it's still something to explore. The second part of the Helach Manya. So that's the, op the opening shot is bread of affliction. Why affliction? Didn't we call, aren't we going to call it soon bread of freedom? So why are we calling it now affliction? What's going on? We're getting mixed messages. Second question. We say, whoever's hungry, come and eat, right? We say, whoever's hungry, come and eat. Whoever's in need, come and participate in the Paschal Lamb, okay? So we're focusing on hunger. We're focusing on need. We're focusing on, on, on the lack, on the want that seems to be at odds with the whole theme of the Seder. The whole theme of the Seder is freedom. The whole theme of the Seder is opulence. The whole theme of the Seder is plenty. In fact, when we eat, how do we eat? Reclining. Why are we reclining? Because we're like 
kings, kings, I'm looking at these couches, these very comfortable couches. Imagine you eat on a couch and you know, like the old picture of the kings being fed with grapes, you know, like the whole thing. Never, I've never experienced that, but the concept, the grapes with people fanning you or something, if it's hot, who knows, even if it's not hot, it's probably cool to get fanned. And the point is that if you're a king, if you're a queen, if you're royalty, you may not be sitting like this. You're, you know, you're relaxing. I mean, that doesn't look comfortable either, but like you're relaxing, you're leaning, you're reclining. It's a party, you're, you're chilling as they say, as the kids like to say. Yeah, so that's the, that's the whole energy at the Seder. You already did it by Kiddush. You did the Kaddish, you did the Kiddush, and you were leaning when you ate it. So now we're like, oh, whoever's hungry, come and eat. Whoever's in need, come and enjoy the Paschal Lamb. So now we're speaking about need and want and lack. Aren't we supposed to focus on the opulence, on the plenty, on the freedom? Why, why, why are we focusing on the need? Especially the first statement that we make is a statement about need. Finally, as Ed pointed out, this, the last paragraph, which talks about this year we're here, next year in, in Israel, this year we're enslaved, next year we'll be free. This year we are enslaved. Aren't we sitting down to the Seder to, to celebrate freedom? And what's the first thing we say at the Seder? Passover night. The first thing we say is the opening paragraph. At the end of the opening paragraph, the first thing, first thing we say is we're slaves. We're slaves? So then what are we doing with the Seder? Are you with me on the question? If we're still, sla if we're still slaves then what are we celebrating tonight? What in the world are we celebrating? Hashata avdin, this year we're slaves, next year we're free. So come back next year and have a Seder. If you're free next year, come back next year. We'll save the brisket for you. Why are we celebrating Passover? We're having a Seder, ostensibly celebrating freedom. And in the opening paragraph of our freedom celebration, we make a declaration, we're slaves. Only Jews could come up with such a twisted scenario, such a twisted narrative. We're celebrating freedom. We've been cleaning and cooking and preparing for weeks. Yeah. Buying wine and matzah and meat and chicken, gefilte fish, the whole shebang. Getting our mar, grating our horseradish, right? Preparing the romaine, romaine lettuce. By the way, it's not so easy. You have romaine lettuce. You want to eat lettuce? Oh, the leafy vegetables. You got to check for bugs because bugs are unkosher. So you got to rinse them. You soak them. You got to hold them up to the light, to see if there are any bugs, clean them off, and then now you have your mar. You got to mix, you got to get your um, your salt water uh, mixture ready. You can't do it on Shabbos, by the way. So Friday night Seder, you got to do it before Shabbos. You got to get your salt water mixed, make sure you do it before candle lighting. Friday night, this year it's different. On, on Yom Tif, on a holiday, you can do it. But on Shabbos, you're not supposed to mix, you're not supposed to create a salt water mixture. So make sure you get that in Friday afternoon. My point is you've done a lot of preparation. Why? For this freedom celebration. And what's the opening paragraph? This year, we are slaves. Next year, we're free. What, what kind of Judaism, right? Rabbi, <laughs> don't forget the shank bone. Don't forget the shank bone. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to you don't want to make a mistake with that. You don't want to shank the shank bone. That would be that would be quite the error. By the way, just as an aside, just as an aside, the um, the Chabad custom is to use a chicken neck instead of a shank. Bone. Yeah, legit chicken neck. Straight up roasted chicken neck. Why? Who knows? I mean, there are reasons. For, and I know there are reasons for it, but that's not for right now. Uh, different customs. By the way, another area of difference in custom is regarding the carapace, the vegetable you dip in the salt water. Some people use parsley. Some use um, celery. Chabad uses usually either onion, raw onion, or potato. I mean, like Russian stuff, because Chabad is Russian. From Russia. It's like, what else? You get potato. Done. Plenty of potatoes to be had. Again, the question that we're focusing on is if I had to summarize all these questions into one, it seems like a very rocky start to our Seder. Honestly, just to be very, very honest here. It seems like a very rocky and counterintuitive start to our Seder. We did, we did a few rituals. We're sitting down to tell the story. And the first message is by the way, I wish we were free. I wish we were free. <laughs> Wish we were free. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is bread of affliction. It's terrible. Oh, look at all the hunger out there in the world. Oh, we're slaves. Wow. Talk about a pessimistic start to the Seder. Totally pessimistic. This bread, affliction. People, hi, everyone's going hungry. And this year, we're slaves. Talk about bitter herb. <laughs> Uncle bitter. bitter. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, this is, this is what's going on. This is how we start the Seder. It seems very, yeah. very strange. Yes, right. All right. So when we do Avadim Hayinu, we're saying we used to be slaves 
And then Hashem reached out his arm Good. and took. Yeah, I, I love that paragraph. We used to be slaves and then God took us out. You know what we say in this paragraph, the opening one? Hashata Avdin, we're slaves now. Go make sense of that one. Hashata Avdin. Ray, you are 100% right. That paragraph, Avadam Hayinu, makes sense. That paragraph makes sense. This one makes no sense. And my point is that this is the first paragraph that we say, and we overlook it. That's our today's class. I'm going to point out something in the Haggadah that we all say. I mean, who skips over the first paragraph? I, even if you're running to the brisket, you probably get in the first paragraph before you start turning pages. The first paragraph, right? You would think you get in the first. The first paragraph makes no sense. It's, it's, it's so the Siddur here has part of the part of the Haggadah. And, and this one starts from Avadam Hayinu. Again, it's not the whole thing. And you're right. Avadam Hayinu, the paragraph that you're referring to, Ray, you are accurate. The paragraph says, and I'm going to read it in the English. We were slaves to Egypt. Sorry, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Lord, our God, took us out from there with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. That's great. You know what that means? We used to be slaves and now we're free. But that's not the opening paragraph. That's a little bit later. The opening paragraph is this bread, slavery bread. Yeah, people are going hungry. And this year, we're slaves. Doesn't even make sense. The whole thing doesn't make sense. Actually, tonight, we're going to sign a petition to have it removed. I'm kidding. Tonight, we're going to explore the deeper significance of this paragraph that will absolutely rock your world and change the way you think about the Seder. That's my goal. If I fall, fall short, um, you can submit your complaints. To, no, I'm kidding. If I fall short, I fell short. But hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll have a completely different understanding of the Seder, the Haggadah, that opening paragraph, life itself, history, and you'll also have something cool to share at your own Seder. Questions make sense? Yes? Yes? Why focus on the negative as we... Uh, in, in, the, in the Haggadah, doesn't it say we have to regard ourselves as if each of us had personally been redeemed from Egypt. So is that why we say we're slaves? Good. I hear you. You know, we're saying that if we're supposed to experience freedom, that means we have to be slaves first to then experience freedom. I hear that. Okay, let's... Good. I, li I, I, like, I like how you're thinking. So let's... Good. Hold that thought. I want to go back to the beginning. Not the beginning of the Seder. Beginning of creation. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. And God placed Adam and Eve in a very special place. We know that as the Garden of Eden. And what happened in the Garden of Eden? God said, everything is at your disposal. Everything you want, whatever you want. Enjoy. Enjoy. Imagine that you get placed in your favorite store. Imagine. Imagine your favorite store. For some people, it's Best Buy. Oh, and electronics and gadgets. And some people, it's... Um, uh, Toys R Us. Toys R Us. Oh, amazing. Gavaldic. Remember the one in Times Square? Did that one shut down with the one to Ferris wheel? I feel like it did. Anyway. Um, yeah. Some people, it's uh, Macy. Some people, it's whatever. So imagine Nordstrom, Bloomingdale, Saks Fifth Avenue. Now we're talking Crate and Barrel, Pottery Barn, Vichuli, et cetera. So imagine you're told you can have whatever you want. Enjoy. Whatever you want. One thing, just this one thing, don't touch. Get everything else. One thing you can't touch? That's unacceptable. Adam and Eve are like, forget about it. Nothing else that we want, just this one forbidden fruit. Unbelievable. This is the power, that's the power of, of human psychology. Just tell someone not to look over there. Like, don't look over there. Like, whatever you, don't look there. Next thing you know, they're going to be stealing a glance. All right, Everyone's wondering what's over there now, even after that setup. The point is that Adam and Eve jump into action and eat from the tree. By the way, here's the truth. They were created on the sixth day of creation, which was, in our understanding, of Friday. So right, day one is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Our tradition tells us, Kabbalah emphasizes this, that had they made it till Shabbat without sin, that would have been it. It would have been a perfect world forever. They had a few, they were created like midday, Friday. They had like five, six hours to hold out from eating from the tree of knowledge. Could they? <laughs> no. Two hours in, an hour in, I don't know, one or a few hours in, next thing you know, they're chomping 
on the on the old forbidden fruit. By the way, what was it? Not necessarily an apple, according to our tradition. The, the Talmud has a debate as to what was the actual forbidden fruit. Different opinions. Some say it was actually grapes that turned into wine. Some people say it was a. I to remember what the different opinions were. Um, like wheat or something, even though it's not yeah, a fruit. Wheat. Yeah, wheat and other stuff. Anyway, the pomegranate. point. Is, pomegranate. They couldn't hold themselves back and they ate. Here's what happened next. Here's what happened next. Everything shifts. So I'm going to pull up this text. We're going to explore text 5a and 5b. This is coming from the Archaim, Archaim Ibn Attar. He was a Kabbalist, a Mukubal, lived in the uh, 1700s. And he wrote a commentary on the Torah that intersperses mystical wisdom into a biblical commentary. It's a really beautiful commentary. I'm going to read a few of these texts. Text 5a and 5b. Here we go. God's primary reason for prohibiting the tree of knowledge was to prevent the human mind from grasping or perceiving the notion of transgression, to be focused completely on holiness without conceiving of the possibility of turning from God. This is what King Solomon meant when he wrote, God made man upright. The human was made with, with only one kind of knowledge, that of holiness. Thoughts of transgression did not figure into our imagination and fantasies at the time of our creation. In other words, God created, I'm going to use my own words here, God created Adam and Eve, naive. They were naive, simple, focused. They didn't know, you know like the Yiddish English expression, they didn't know from bad. No one said that in English ever, but Yiddish, it works. You translate it directly. They didn't know from these things. They didn't know from evil. They didn't know about transgression and unholiness and evil and impropriety and transgression. They didn't know these things. All they knew was God and purpose, and they were pure, pure and innocent. By the way, that's why, famously, as all of the commentators point out, the Torah emphasizes this for a reason. The Torah tells us that they were not wearing clothes, and they weren't, they weren't embarrassed. Why? Because they didn't know enough to know that they should be embarrassed. Are you with me? You know, there's another demographic of people that are not embarrassed, not wearing clothes. You know what we call them? Children, right? Kids, you'll have company over and the two-year-old will begin. Yeah, we got a streak, right? What's going on? They don't know. They don't know that it's a thing that they should be embarrassed about or they should, they should cover up. Why? It's the naivete. So Adam and Eve were created naive, i.e. pure. What happens? Well, the serpent comes slithering up. Actually, at that point, it was upright. The serpent comes sauntering over to Eve and says, hey, why don't you try that? And implants an idea of something. We've all had that experience, right? There were things that we would never have considered doing until like, somebody suggested it or it crossed our paths. And suddenly it's like, oh, maybe it is a possibility, right? There are things that were never in a realm of, of, of awareness. We didn't even know about it. And then suddenly... Someone said something, or we saw something, or whatever. Now it's like, oh, may maybe and that's what happened slowly but surely. Eve goes ahead and eats from the tree, and then Adam, and then everything shifts. Five B. Let's continue. Uh, the Ibn, uh, sorry, the uh, Archaim Akader says the following: When Adam and Eve partook of the tree of knowledge, what happened? They first became aware of the possibility of transgression and were ashamed, as the following passage attests. And they knew that they were naked and they were ashamed, meaning they started to have shame and embarrassment. Shame, I've defined this in classes. It's been a while since we've talked about shame, the difference between like shame and guilt. Shame is feeling the gulf between where you are and where you know you ought to be. Is looking at oneself in the mirror and saying, oh, this is where I'm at. I could be here. I should be there. That's the idea of shame, a feel, feeling of, of falling short of our true potential. There's a shame in that. And Adam and Eve certainly had that feeling at this point, like seeing where they've fallen, where they were, where they should be, where they could be, that induced shame. You know what the next scene is? Adam is hiding from God, as if hiding, right? He's hiding. And God's like, where are you? Ayaka, where are you? Adam's like, I'm hiding amongst the bushes. God says, why are you hiding? And Adam says, because I'm not wearing clothes. And God says, who told you that not wearing clothes is a thing? Like, is a thing to hide about? Did you eat from the tree? <laughs> That's how. So God confronts him. Um, but yeah, that what happens by eating from the fruit of the tree of knowledge? What's, what type of knowledge? Well, now I know it's trigonometry, calculus, right? Astrophysics, no. The tree of knowledge is knowledge or awareness of something other than purpose. 
is that distraction. It's a knowledge of essentially otherness. So as opposed to being locked into your purpose, locked into your yet yeah, naively not locked into where you're supposed to be. Suddenly now, you know, all, all other sorts of things that are distractions from where you're supposed to be. And that is that that is shameful. And so what happens in that moment is as and I'm giving you kind of like an amalgam of of, I don't know, 3000 years of Jewish scholarship and, and Jewish uh, the Torah interpretation along the lines of simple explanation, philo philosophical explanations, historical explanations, mystical explanations. If you put everything together, what's clear is that at that point, a major rift is created between creation and creator. Whereas before everything was synchronistic. I mean, it didn't last for that long. For a few hours with man, with human beings on board, things were, were, were in sync, right? Human beings were in sync with their purpose, in sync with God. The, 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 the sin of the tree of knowledge represents a rift, a separation that, 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 that is created between humanity and God or between essentially ourselves and our purpose. Between us and God now, there's a, there's a gap. There's a separation. Spent a year in London in yeshiva, and we used to ride the tube. And there was always the, the refrain was, mind the gap. My, it was a recording. It was a women's voice. Mind the gap, or whatever the, the accent is not my, my specialty. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. There's a gap. Now there's a gap. There wasn't a gap with the sin. Now there's a gap. Now we've got to navigate the gap. Our sages tell us that the gap widened over the, over the generations. Take a look at the next text. This will blow your mind. Text 6a from the Midrash. When Adam sinned, the divine presence ascended to the first heaven. When Cain sinned, it ascended to the second heaven. When Enosh sinned, it ascended to the third heaven. When the generation of the deluge, the flood, sinned, it ascended to the fourth heaven. When the generation that built the Tower of Babel sinned, it ascended to the fifth heaven. When the residents of Sodom sinned, it ascended to the sixth heaven. In the lifetime of Abraham, which was a time of paganism, etc., idolatry, the Egyptians sinned, and it ascended it, meaning the, the, the Shekhinah, the divine presence, really she, not it, ascended to the seventh heaven. The Midrash says that God progressively ascended. And what that means is not something mystical or supernatural and in very simple terms. Think about any relationship that you have, any relation, doesn't matter, parent, child, friend, neighbor, business, uh, marriage, any relationship you have. What happens, what could happen is you turn away from the other, you do something that dishonors, disrespects, right? Harms the other, et cetera, the other. And now there's a gap. You do something else, the gap widens. This is what the measures are saying, that generation after generation, mankind keeps on turning further away from God. And what does that mean? Sorry. And what happens? The gap widens. The, the language of the measures, God ascended to the next heaven. What does that mean? God took an elevator up? Come on. It means that between us and God, the gap widens. On a very practical level, people forgot more and more and more about God. Like any Again, any relationship where two people drift apart, it started off with a little drift. It ends up, I mean, hopefully not, but it could end up with a big drift, with a big gap. And how did it start? A little thing. And now we're not talking to each other for 20 years. That's what's going on between us and God. Then came along seven tzaddikim and reintroduced the world to God or reintroduced God to the world, starting with Abraham. Take a look at the next text. Okay, we're walking down memory lane taking a tour of history, 6B. Opposite them, ah, oh, that's uh, not a great translation. To counteract the efforts of the wicked, there arose seven righteous people and returned the divine presence to earth. They brought heaven back down to earth, brought, reintroduced God into the lexicon of humanity. Abraham merited to usher it from the seventh heaven to the sixth. Isaac arose and ushered it from the sixth to the fifth. Jacob arose and ushered it from the fifth to the fourth. Levi arose and ushered it from the fourth to the third. Kahat arose and ushered it from the third to the second. Amram, Moses' father, arose and ushered it from the second to the first. And Moses arose and ushered it to earth. Meaning seven righteous generations followed. And in those generations, those, in, in those times, in those generations, God was reintroduced to humanity. 
And all this culminates, of course, in the times of Moses, when the, when the Shekhinah, when the divine presence comes back down to earth, in the form of the exodus from Egypt, the splitting of the sea, and the revelation at Sinai. These are experiences in which it's clear that there is a God, and that God has taken an active role in the affairs, in the, in the goings-on of planet Earth. Does that make sense? Yes? So God created heaven and Earth. And in the beginning, everything was peachy. And then Adam and Eve ate from the tree. And what happens is a rift breaks out. And that rift grows wider. The gap grows wider. The gulf grows wider. Until seven righteous people came along and reintroduced God to, to earth and reintroduced earth to God and brought the two parties together. Rabbi Ari, quick question. Yes. Is that who the seven shepherds are? Depends who you ask. There are, um, you know, on Sukkot, there are seven Ushbizin. You ever heard that term, the seven guests in the Sukkah? Those are different. No. Those are different characters. No. no, some place, I can't recall where, it talks about the seven shepherds. Right, it does. It depends on the context. What I'm saying is, is that there are different counts of seven righteous people. This is one count that goes from Abraham to Moses. You get seven from Abraham to Moses. Some go all the way to um, to King David, right? And so, and they use Joseph and King David and King Solomon or just King David. I don't know. Anyway, but there, there are different counts. So when we talk about the seven shepherds, it re I don't know if there's one um, definitive count of the seven. It might be contextually based. This is definitely one count of the seven righteous, but there's other counts as well. It's a good question. Um, I'm avoiding answering you definitively because a lot of this stuff, events of Umaret, depends which, uh, which source we're dealing with. Okay, so back to the narrative. The point here is, is that the Exodus, that, that whole experience of busting out of Egypt with 10 plagues, the sea splitting, you know, getting the Torah, the Ten Commandments at Sinai, all of that represents God returning to humanity in a really incredible uh, moment, in incredible experience. But here's the kicker. You can take the slave out of Egypt, but you can't so easily take the Egypt out of the slave. That's the truth of life. You can take someone out of a bad situation, but you can't erase the trauma from that individual. You can't, there's no erase button. You can pull someone, right? I mean, you know, there's horrific stories of like human trafficking. And, you know, we all know these stories of, uh, I mean, uh, most of the stories we never, we never hear for whatever reason. That's another question. But when you hear sometimes these high profile cases of, of people kidnapped and, and they're held and 20 years later they break out. And yeah, you can take someone out of the situation, out of that horrific situation. Yeah, and it can happen in one moment, they're rescued. How long does it take to get rid of the trauma? One moment? I don't think so. Why? Because it's easier, it's quicker to, take some, to extract someone out of a situation than to extract the situation out of them. And so the Jews were taken out of Egypt. But how long did it take for the Egypt to get out of the Jews? You with me on the question? Yeah? A lot longer than, uh, than, than 10, 10 plagues. A lot longer than the experience at Sinai, how do I know this? Did we actually go back to Egypt? Yes, multiple times over 40 years, even at the end of the 40 years. Like, why are we? Yeah, uh, Miriam passes away at the end of the 40 years, Moses' sister, and the water um, resource draws, uh, dr uh, dries up. People said, oh, we're going to die of thirst. Why did we leave Egypt? It's 40 years later. It's the next year, the kids. 40 years later, they're still saying, you know, still singing that tune, like, why are we here? Anyway. Um, you can take the slave out of Egypt, but you can't just take the, the Egypt out of the slave. You can't just take the Egypt out of the psyche, out of the, the, the emotional, you know, the, you, you, there's no button that you press to erase trauma, to erase that negativity. And the greatest proof is the greatest proof. You know, you would think that everything culminates with Sinai. Oh, that's full freedom, transformation. They got their marching orders. Now they're different. Yeah, what happens 40 days later? We all know the story. We saw the movie, right? Charlton Heston comes down the mountain, the two tablets. And what are the Jews doing? 40 days after Sinai. 
Yeah. What are they doing? Worshiping the golden calf. Where do they pick up worship of the golden calf? Where do you think Abraham taught them that? You think Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Levi, any of the 12 tribes? Where, where did they learn that from? Egypt. Egypt. There's um, one of the most, in, to me, one of the most incredible verses in the, in the Torah is where the Torah says, in Deuteronomy, do not hate the Egyptian because you were strangers in their land. <laughs> Crazy verse. Do not hate the Egyptians like you were guests in their land. Like you should, you should, yeah, don't hate them. Don't hate the Egyptian. Of course you should hate the Egyptian. They, they enslaved you. Why wouldn't you hate the Egyptian? Torah is trying to rip out the hate, to rip that out of us. Because if you still hate, you know what you're not? You're not free. They still have a hold on you. If you hate, you know what that means? The Egyptians enslaved you, sure. Then you hate, then after, after you're out, now you hate them? Hate? You hate them? Guess who's still stuck in Egypt? Guess who's still stuck, right? Rent free in your head, in your heart. They're not paying any rent, and you, they're still, they're still, you're still obsessed, obsessed with hate, can't get over it. All right, you're still stuck. And so, and here's where I'm going with this. We we trace, we track the the um, trajectory from the beginning of time. We started off in paradise, then we went down, and then we got back up. But here's the point: even as we got back up, the pinnacle, the height of our, you know. Freedom, Exodus, uh, Sinai experience at the height of our, I don't know what you would call it, glory. The Egyptian, the, the condition of slavery was still inside of us on some level. And ever since, although on some level we're free because we're out of Egypt, on another level, Egypt is not fully out of us. Because, and here's the main point, God can take us out of Egypt, but you know who can, who's the only one who can take the Egypt out of us? Us. It's like old Hasidic tale. You want to clean a sheep. Has anyone cleaned a sheep lately? Probably not. You want to clean a sheep? Yeah, you can wash it. You can shampoo it. You can scrub it. Apparently. You can comb it. You can brush it. You, whatever you want. But you're never going to get the dirt all the way on the inside. The only one that can is the sheep. The sheep gives one tracel, one, one, one move, one shake or a few shakes, and that pulls out. There's only so much you can do from the outside. But the true liberation has to come from the inside. So what happened 3,333 years ago at the Exodus? What happened 3,333 years ago at Sinai? Was God lifted us up? Great. God lifted us out and lifted us up. Wonderful. But you know what God can't do? Transform us from the inside out. Because only we can do that. I mean, God theoretically could do that, but that's not the point. The point is that we should do that. God shows us where we can be. Here's the mountain. Now get there on your own. Now you earn your freedom. Not even earn it. It's not about earning. Now you really become free. And if you're wondering... Like, Am I your frozen? We're frozen. Yes. I told him also. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I heard you. I thought it was me. <laughs> I so now it dropped off. It dropped off. You should make a sign, frozen. Sing this song. <laughs> oh, from Frozen, right. From the movie. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, 
this is the longest that's ever happened. Yeah, it's like, I hope it's not 40 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> well. You're muted, Rabbi. Can you guys hear me and see me? Yes. We could. Now we can. Amazing. Finally, but Amazing. <laughs> so you, not you, sure what you, happened. You have to go all the way back. All right. Turns out my computer restarted for whatever reason that it chose to. So uh, we cut out for a little bit. But here's, here's the point. Here's the big idea. And as Robert was saying, you know, we can, if, if we keep the status quo, here's what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that if we don't, if we don't strive for inner freedom, there is no automatic inner freedom that, that happens. It's not like, well, God took us out of Egypt, so therefore we're free. And I, I, this was the point I was about to say. You don't need any greater proof than looking at, around at the world, right? Is the world free of jealousy? Is the world free of evil? Is the world free of hate? Is the world free of bloodshed? Of course it's not. Uh, not of course. It's not. And the proof is, look around. Right now, right now, 2022, there are human atrocities being perpetrated by individuals, by nations, etc. And this is the reality of the world we live in. The world is far from the Garden of Eden. We started off in paradise. Then we went down. According to our tradition, we went back up. And my point tonight is, even though we went back up, we didn't go all the way back up. We didn't fully heal from the problem. Because the problem is inside and nothing that happens outside can really fill it, can really fix that. You can't fix a problem from the outside in. It doesn't work. It doesn't actually fix it. So that's why in our tradition, Mount Sinai is not a holy site. Why? Because it was top down. God, 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 revelation from Sinai. We don't hallow, we don't, we don't revere Mount Sinai. We don't even know where it is. I mean, their Torah guides will tell you where it is. Sure, because, you know, that's how they, but we don't actually know where it is. It's never become a hallowed site in Judaism. Why? Because what happened? God gave us the Torah. That's wonderful, but there was no transformation. Transformation doesn't happen from the outside in. Right, transformation happens through the choices we make, through that choice to be free and to be different. There's no automatic button. There's no button that you press, the freedom button. Now I'm free. God took me out, I'm free. That's not how it works. God took you out to enable you to now choose to be free, to now work to be free, to now put in the effort to free yourself. So the step one is, yes, you, you have to have a platform for that freedom. But step two is, that's 1.0, step, that's where God takes us out. Freedom 2.0 is where we free ourselves, where we choose and we act on that freedom in a way that is truly liberating, truly, truly noble. And so my friends, hopefully this explains the opening of the Seder. What happens on Passover? We're celebrating the Exodus, but the Exodus is only the first part of the story. The, re the second part of the story is what's happened over the last 3,333 years. That's the rest of the story. We're still living that the rest of the freedom because the freedom that happened 3,333 years ago was not complete freedom. And that's why we start the Seder by saying, you know what we're eating tonight? Bread of affliction. Because on some level, we're still afflicted. We're still eating. We're still in Egypt. Now, what, what's, what do you mean? We're free. We're free? Look around. We're free. Are there hungry people? Are there people that are hungry? Yes. How free are we? That's the Helach Ma'anya. This is the bread of affliction that our forefathers ate in Egypt. On some level, we're still sitting in Egypt. Then we talk about all those who are hungry, come and eat. All those who are needy, come and eat the Paschal Lamb. What's the message? The message is we live in a world in which there's hunger, where there's need, where there's pain, where there's suffering. That means that the world is not healed yet. That means that there is not a global transformation or a global a global exodus. And even our own exodus. Hashata hacha l'shana abba ba'ar Yisrael. Today we're here. Next year in Jerusalem. Today we're slaves. Hashata avdin. Today we're, this year we're slaves. Next year, please God, we'll be free. The message is, again, that freedom has not yet been fully realized because it is, as Nelson Mandela said, it's a long march to freedom. It's a long walk, and we're still on that walk. So we started the class by talking about the opening of the Haggadah, the Magad. We sit down Seder night, and you would think we would talk about freedom. No, we talk about slavery. And the question is why? And we ask a bunch of questions. Hey, this is the bread of affliction. 
We're talking about people who are hungry. We talk about being slaves. What's going on here? I thought we're free. Isn't that what we're celebrating? It's more nuanced than that. What we're, what we're saying, the first thing that we mentioned at the Seder, the, the, opening, the opening declaration at the Seder is, yes, God freed us. But no, we have not yet freed ourselves. No, we're still subject to our own ego and we're still subject to our own jealousies and we're still subject to our own hatred and prejudices and we're still subject to our insecurities and we're still struggling. And therefore we live in a world of pain. Sorry, we live in a world in which pain is still exists and that's not good enough. We want real freedom, real freedom next year in Jerusalem, next year to be free. We want, we want the Messianic, Mashiach. We want a world that's finally free of all pain and suffering. What we like to say, right, the, 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 the colloquial expression, world peace. That's what we want. We want a world that, that and a world peace is not a magical thing. It's, it's a product of people being at peace with themselves and being free, free of all of the negativity that lies inside. So that's how we start the Seder. We start the Seder by talking about how we're not there yet. We don't waive the mission accomplishment. We're done. We finished. We're done. We're free. We're not free yet. God took us out, but that's what God did. Then there's what we have to do, and that's still a work in progress. We're still working on freeing ourselves, on taking the Egypt, again, Egypt, taking whatever negativity, we'll just call it Egypt, out of us. That's still an ongoing process. And so this Pesach, this Passover, we sit down at our Seder. And as we're around, please God, we're, we're sitting around the table with family and friends. And we do the Kiddush. And then we wash the hands. And then we dip the vegetable and eat it. And then we break the middle matzah. And then we say, hey, lach ma'anya, of son of This is the bread of affliction that they ate in Egypt. Let's remember that on some level, we're still in Egypt. Because Egypt is still in us. And we should not be satisfied with the progress we've made, but we should strive to finally get to the finish line. I've used this analogy before. Imagine a relay race. A relay race, right? Somebody runs around, right? The first runner runs around the track, gets to the starting point, hands the baton to the next. Every generation has run their lap. And every generation has passed the baton to the next generation. And now it's us, and we have the baton, and we're running toward that finish line. And we have to believe that we are the ones that can get there. Otherwise, it's not a Jewish thought to think that it's not us. We're the ones to get it to that finish line. And in the stands, all of the previous generations are cheering us on. And their only message, don't drop the baton Keep on running, keep on running, keep on striving, keep on making this world a better place and make work on ourselves to become better people because we can get there. So that's how we begin the Seder, by talking about our aspiration, by talking about not what we've accomplished, but about the goal that we're trying to achieve and how we're not there yet. <laughs> this is not a depressing start to the Seder, but again, it's an aspirational one. If for the last 3,300 years we've been saying, look what we did, it would get old really fast. How many times can we pat ourselves on the back? Look what we did. We're free. All right, we get it already. You're free. That's not the message of the Seder. The message of the Seder is God took us out so that we should free ourselves. And we're not there yet. There's something still to work on, which is why we get together every year. So this year, enjoy the brisket. Enjoy the gefilte fish. Enjoy the crane. Enjoy the, the horseradish. Enjoy the wine, enjoy the matzah, but just remember, there's no easy fix. The only real stuff, the only real solution, the real fix happens from within. And we're not there yet, but please God, we will. And as we say next year in Jerusalem, the, the understanding is we shouldn't have to wait a full year. Next year means by next year, we'll already have been well settled in Jerusalem. May we experience this internal transformation very, very soon, if not immediately. May we have all of the peace and the blessings that we want for ourselves in the world. And may we indeed, this Passover, may this Passover, which is starting in a little over a week, may this one already be in Jerusalem. And let us say, 
Amen. Thank you for joining me tonight for the uh, Pesach Boot Camp and for Torah Studies Passover Edition. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll stick on for more, stick around for more qu for questions and uh, discussion. Pleasure. Questions? Yeah, question with Shabbat. So yes. Last, um, last year was Saturday, Saturday night. night. Right. It's just Friday night. I mean, before. Yeah. Uh, but so this, this year, Shabbat. So is the Kiddush of the Agada, for example? The Kiddush in the Haggadah will have like a usually a shaded area that says on Friday nights, you start off with the Friday night and then you segue into the, the Passover. You kind of double it up. You really mentioned both. You mentioned Shabbos and Pesach. Yeah. So it's, it's a modified version of the, it's a longer version of the, the, the Pesach Kiddush. That's what we do. Um, what else do you need to know? You know, because it's Friday night and not Saturday night, a lot of, you know, the, the interesting, you know, things of last year don't apply. Like, you don't have to have, like, you don't have to dive in Shabbos morning early and walk for challah and then finish it and then flush the piece into the toilet because you can't burn the chametz on Shabbos morning. You eat it like, like it's like a normal year. It's like a usual, it's like a typical year where you finish eating chametz. You know, let me actually pull up the times here so I'll give you accurate information. Um, give me a second here. One second. Let's do Chabad Zmanim 30306. That's this neighborhood. So it may be a little bit different where you are. Um, change location to 306. And, okay, here we go. I'm going to change the date to next week, to uh, April 15th. Okay, here we go. You have to, so we are supposed to finish eating chametz before 11.26 a.m. In other words, you can't eat chametz. You're not supposed to eat chametz up until like the Seder. 11.26 a.m. is the deadline for all your chametz. So have your cereal, have your toast, have your avocado toast, whatever it is before 11.26. An hour later, 12.31, you're supposed to have already sold and burnt the remainder of your chametz. Now, look, you don't have to burn all your chametz if you have stuff that can stay a week or so in your pantry. Sure, put it there, put it in a, or put it in a cabinet, tape it up and sell it. There's a form where you can sell it where it's legally not yours. That way you don't own chametz over the holiday. There's an easy form on Chabad.org. Just go to Chabad.org, look for the Passover selling chametz form. You fill it out, takes two minutes, name, address, doesn't require any money. You just sell it and you're done. And then just whatever chametz you have, just make sure to, and you can do it well before the holiday. Just make sure you put it in a secure location, tape it up. Ideally, you don't see it and that's it. So if you have cereal, if you have you know, other perishable stuff like we do. We have like a little pantry with a with a door. We just put all of our chametz in there, close the door, put a little tape over it, and we sell it. It's done. Okay, that's it. Then whatever chametz you have that you don't want to put away, you burn. And if you don't have chametz, then still burn. So we the night before, actually Thursday night this year, we the tradition is you put out ten pieces of of bread and wrap it up in like the paper or whatever. And you put it around the house and you search for the chametz. So you put it out. So one person puts it out. The other person, another person searches for it. There's a blessing that you say before <laughs> searching for the chametz, but that's the tradition that we do the night before Arab Pesach. So that would be Thursday night this year. So you do the, it's called Bedikas chametz, the search for the chametz. Then you find those 10 pieces. You have to find those 10 pieces or else you know that there's chametz in your house that you didn't find. So make sure somebody writes down the location of the 10 pieces. Whoever's hiding it should know where they hid it. And uh, you go around and you check and you find for the chametz, the 10 pieces, you put those away for the next morning. And that's what you burn along with whatever else you want to burn um, before 1231 PM on Friday morning, the Seder candle lighting is 750 and the Seder begins. The Seder can begin. Is this the right time? Friday, April 15th. Yeah. Uh, nightfall Seder is 835 PM. So that's when ideally you start the Seder after 8.35. Now, some of you may be wondering, what is one second? The Chabad Seder is advertised for 7.30. What's going on? How are you starting the Seder at 7.30 if Seder Kochavim, if nightfall is only 8.35? What's going on? So here's the truth. Don't tell anybody. We start the Seder with appetizers. 
We don't start it with the Seder with Kaddish, with Kiddush. We start it with, we gather, we have gefilte fish and salads, and we have, you know, beverages, and we schmooze about Passover. And then when the time comes, we do Kiddush. That way you start the Seder already not starving. It's the greatest life hack ever. You have the best of all the worlds. You start a little bit earlier, a little more of a decent time. You're, you start it, you, you already had the first course, so to speak, as opposed to like piling everything, as opposed to going hungry and then piling the whole meal together to the point that it's, uh, it feels unhealthy. We start off course number one, and then we finish that. Then we start the official Seder. And then when we get up to the meal, we continue with the main course. But that way, boom, shakalaka, we're good to go. Anyway, that's a little bit about the Chabad public community Seder, which everyone's invited to. If you know anybody that wants a Seder, needs a Seder, if you or a friend or loved one, then just hit us up. Uh, my wife and I and our family will be running the Seder here at Chabad. Um, that's that's about it. You asked about Friday night. Yeah, there, that's it. I mean, salt water. Make your salt water prep before, obviously, cooking. You, you can cook on a holiday, but not on Shabbat. So, you know, this year, everything's got to be cooked before. Um, you know, for the Seder and fast of, fast of the firstborn. Yeah. Fast of the firstborn son is Friday, but the tradition is that you do a seum, you conclude a tractate of Talmud, or you know someone who did, or you listen to a conclusion of a tractate. And because of the joy of someone concluding a tractate of the Talmud, you can eat. By the way, that does not work for Yom Kippur. Nice try. Oh, hey, I finished a tractate. I think we're good to go. No, it only works for a minor fast days, this will be a minor fast day. The goal is that no one should be fasting Erev Pesach. We intentionally have a seum or participate in one. Seum means a conclusion of a track day so as not to fast. No one's looking to be fasting on Erev Pesach. It's not a, not a thing. It's not a... I don't know anybody who's like doesn't do this. Everyone does the seum. I'm sure you can find one online also. You know, or you know someone who, who did one. Or you could study a tractate. You got a week. <laughs> there are some really small tractates also. Have I? Yeah, right. Oh, uh, so what about the second seder? Can yeah. we, can we, can it start um, by having, like you said, or there are things before the time? You know, you can eat. You can eat that on Shabbos. You know, you can have a late Shabbos uh, meal, which is not a problem. You could have like shalashudas. You could have, you know, toward the end of Shabbat, you can have food. That's not a problem. Um, the pro the challenge with the second Seder this year, actually every year, is you're not supposed to prepare from from Shabbat to a holiday. So to warm up food, or for, you can't warm up food anyway, but like to even prepare to cut up salads, whatever, for Saturday night Seder on Shabbat, you know, Judaism has a thing about focusing on, on the moment at hand, you know, especially if it's a holy day, to not be thinking about the next holy day. So we're not supposed to prepare on Shabbat for the holiday. So all preparation for the second Seder, directly for the second Seder, should begin after nightfall Saturday night. Um, but your question is, can you eat before the answer is sure. You can eat the whole Shabbos. You get the whole Shabbos day. You can go nonstop from 12 p.m. till 6 p.m. And then you will not, I'm not saying you personally, I'm saying one will not be hungry by the time, hopefully not, by the time Saturday night Seder rolls around. So yeah, you don't have to, there's no reason to go into the Seder hungry. Look, the custom is we don't eat anything that's on the Seder plate. So like we don't, because we, we want to, you know, have, um, be excited about the taste. So don't obviously right. eat matzah and don't eat um, whatever, like stuff that's uh, exclusive to the Seder, right? So stuff that's for the Seder. So we don't, we, we don't try, we try not to preempt, you know, try to, you know, right. undermine that. So as not to take so away from the specialness of it. The official time, the official starting time for the second Seder is, Oh, let me, well, I have to take a look. Um, um, official starting time would be after, yeah, after 8.48. 8.48 okay. is candle lighting. Yes, you light candles Saturday night. You light holiday candles after, I mean, we don't do, have we do have dollar, it's complicated. Part of the uh, Kiddush. Second night, you add in a little bit of a Havdalah mention. Fr Friday First Seder, you throw in a little bit of Shabbos mention. Second Seder, you throw in a little Havdalah mention that we're now separating, demarcating between the end of Shabbat and now the holiday that is continuing. So you do mention that. That happens after 848. We don't do, um, we don't start the Seder or prep until 848. It's late. It's late. But hey, no one ever said it's easy to be free. 
<laughs> you want to be free? You got to stay up all night. Anyway, kidding or not. Good. Makes sense. Yes. All right. More of the story. I know I've said this a bunch of times. I've wrapped up a bunch of times. More of the story is on Passover, we celebrate freedom. But now you know that we also celebrate the opportunity to truly become free, which is still a work in progress. That's it. Now you're wondering why I took an hour to say that. Who knows? All right. We'll see you all. Have a wonderful Chag. Enjoy. Chag Sameach. Anyone who has questions, please call me, email me, text me. Happy to, uh, to help. All right. Take care, everybody. Shalom. Thank you. Bye, all.